as we've been going through this series of being Jesus being worthy, um, we've been talking about all the different roles that he plays in our lives and, and what he did for us 2,000 years ago, what he does for us today and what he's continuing to do for us. So it's been really helpful to, to take stock of that again, just reflect on that. Um, as a family, we recently as a, uh, went to Disneyland Paris and it was incredible, absolutely amazing, first time I've ever been and literally when you sort of will first walk underneath and you see that main street it was just mind-blowing and I had the biggest smile on my face I was like this is incredible this is just amazing and it's literally like being in a whole different world I mean so much so that I'm walking around going man look how clean it is none of the bins are overflowing wow like every little detail was mind-blowing and generally bins and stuff it's not something that I take notice of However, after a couple of days, there, we were there for four days, and after a couple of the days, still having an amazing time, still absolutely loving it, but those little things started to sort of fall away, as sort of, you know, you take it for granted, and you sort of take for granted the fact that you can walk in there and just sort of, you know, go on all these rides that are just incredible, and you start to lose that, man, this is something amazing, amazing. And my point being on all of this, that sometimes it can be like that with Jesus. Sometimes when we're living with it day in, day out, we can sometimes start to lose the awe and the wonder of what he is doing day to day. So it's been really helpful to realign our hearts and just remind ourselves of who he is and what he has done for us. So as I say, today we'll be looking at Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And I thought I'd start by asking my boys some questions. I've got two boys, six and nine. I thought I'd ask them some questions on how they define, well, five and nine actually, isn't he? Not actually six. That's... Um, how they define a shepherd, as it's not really a common role um, in our society down nowadays. You see it maybe in like the Christmas nativities, but we don't see it as a regular thing. So here are my questions, only three. So I first of all asked, how would you describe a shepherd? So Toby answered, they're kind, they look after all the animals. Oliver, something to do with sheep. <laughs> I asked, what do shepherds do? Toby. They work hard, picking up doo-doo, and they herd the sheep. <laughs> Oliver, look after sheep. Number three, I said, what do you think Jesus meant when he described himself as the good shepherd? Oliver, he was looking after sheep. <laughs> Toby herds us all up, and when he died, he herded up all the badness and took it away. That was just incredible at that moment when we sat there and he said that. Obviously, Oliver's nailed down the sheep part of shepherding, which is great. <laughs> Um, and Toby focusing on the poo and the doo-doo, which is wonderful, but also how Jesus was our shepherd. So let's now turn and see how Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. So I'm going to be looking at John 10, 1 to 18. And then just sort of break that down and see how, you know, how do we apply this to our lives? How is he still our good shepherd today? And the word should come up behind me as I read through, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. So verse... So John 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some, away, some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. When he is bore out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All of who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf come and he abandons the sheep and runs away, then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Let me pray and then we'll just break that down. Lord, I thank you so much that you are the good shepherd to us. You are the shepherd to us that is just always with us and that you you lay down your life because it was yours to lay down, that you chose to lay it down, pick it up for our sake. And Lord, as we go through this word, Lord, will you just fill us with that awe and wonder again, that how worthy you are of all our praises and our lives. Amen. So first of all, I didn't know this, so bear with me if you all know this, but I didn't know what a sheepfold was. So I looked into it, and this is what a sheepfold is. It seems pretty basic, but back in the day, this was something that a shepherd would make out of whatever he could find sometimes at night if he was walking long journeys with the sheep. It might have been out of sticks or rocks, brambles, covered up, but basically leaving a small gap because the gate wasn't there, and he would become the gate. He would lie in front of the entrance at night and sleep there so that he was the only way in or out of the pen. Obviously just sort of showing here more of a daytime, but the shepherd lying in front of it. And this way it stops the sheep escaping at night and stop walls or thieves coming in. And this helps, well help me anyway, put a bit of perspective on the metaphor Jesus is using for himself as the shepherd, the gate and the gatekeeper. As I go through, I've kind of got three points. Um, every good preach seems to have them, so I followed the uh, same pattern. So my first point is the Good Shepherd guides us. Now we've got membership to Escot, um, which is just up the road in Ottery, and we regularly do the maze. It's one of the boys' favourite things. It's not the most impossible, but challenging enough that it has known to take us a two-hour trip there and only be able to just do the maze. And we usually start every time heading off all of the family. Everyone wants to go, yeah, we'll try and do it together. We head off and there's bridges, you go under turns and bits and pieces. And after a little while, people start to get achy feet and get a bit tired. So someone, usually Laura, and possibly Oliver with his little legs, go into the middle where you can sort of sneak through and then go up in the middle where you can then see from the center, the maze. You can't see every turn, but you can see most of it. And that then helps us to guide us. We sort of walk around with our arm in the air going, over here, over here, and go turn left. No, not that left. <laughs> but that helps a lot and it helps us then complete the path. There is no doubt that in the world that we live in right now, no matter which way you turn, there is confusion, differences of opinion, and leaders of the world trying to pull you this way and that. And obviously the next six weeks are going to be full of that. And we need a truth that cuts through it all and guides us. We need someone looking out from the high point centre of the maze to help guide us which way to go. And Jesus is that. In Activate, in our kids' work, we've recently been doing the song One Way by Hillsong. Some very energetic actions that they absolutely nail. I, even though I'm the one teaching them, I seem to get it wrong almost every time following a YouTube video. I'm looking at the actions on the phone, trying to copy them, and I'm getting it wrong, but for some reason, Activate are absolutely nailing it. But the bit that we started with in the main section that we concentrate on is the bridge that goes, you are the way, the truth and the life. I live by faith and not by sight. For you, we're living all for you. <coughs> I'm not gonna try and do the actions now because I'll undoubtedly get it wrong. Aaron's laughing knowing that I absolutely would get it wrong straight away. But it is so amazing and incredible to see and hear our young people singing and dancing with joy to these words as we want them to cement it as ours as the foundation of our way of living. We live by faith, not by sight. You are the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we want as our rock, as our cementing status of how we live our lives now. When I was young, my stepmom's family owned a dairy farm, 
Um, me and my brother, we were, I think we were about 13 and 10, used to go up and regularly um, help some basic bits we could, fill in the feed for milk in time, spudding, which is great fun, stood on the back of a tractor throwing stones off and letting the potatoes go through, and feeding the calves. But there were things that we couldn't do, like moving the crowd, cows across the fields. We wouldn't have been able to because we were too young, but we also wouldn't have been able to because the cows don't listen to us. They didn't know who we were, they were actually quite afraid of us. But the main guys on the farms, John and David, would just stand at a gate and just call, come on then, and all the cows would just start going and heading off. And I always found this so incredible, I thought, wow, what a control they've got. <coughs> and think about it, the cows saw them as a safe voice, the providers of food and comfort, so they quite happily followed, because they think, this is a good thing for me. And it's the same now, we've got a new puppy, six months old, and he follows us, he follows our voice, he knows that we're safe. And John and David would lead them into a new field or section of the field when it was the right time when the grass in that bit had been eaten, time to move on to a fresh section. And then the cow would be contained by some sort of electric wire, electric fence. Me and my brother found out the hard way that it hurts if you touch it, or pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did do that once. I think it was actually John or David that dared us to do it, so they weren't the safest voice for us. Now this wasn't put there to hurt them, the cows, maybe us but to contain them for their benefit. And sometimes life can be a bit like that for us. I've had conversations where people reject the Christian faith because they don't like the idea of all the rules that come with it. But what they fail to see is that sometimes we're instructed to do or not do things for our own benefit. Following Jesus as our shepherd and guide is the best thing we can do because of the incredible things that he has done in our lives is doing and will do. I'm sure a lot of us here could share testimony where we've made difficult choices that we feel Jesus is leading us this way, but we don't seem to understand it or a bit worried about what might happen. <coughs> but actually when we look back on that, we go, we see how Jesus was working through that situation. A relationship with Jesus and following him is the only way into heaven. He opened the door, he is the gate, and when he came, he died and rose again to take the weight of our sin and pay the punishment of death for us. We might think we're a good person or do all right or do good things, but on that basis, we don't go to heaven. But as Jesus says in the scripture, it's only through him, through his gate that he created that we get to heaven. And then my second point being, the good shepherd protects us. Jesus explains that that relationship with him is one of more than just him being a hired hand doing a job. A shepherd hired isn't invested in the sheep. Sure, they would look after them while being paid to do so, but ultimately they don't care that much. As Jesus says in verse 12, the hired hand will run away when danger comes. But Jesus is not like that. He is invested in us. He loves us and cares for us as his own. He lays down his life for us. We are counted as children welcomed into the house of God because of it. I felt reminded of one of my early wow moments of realisation of how crazy it is that our God knows us and loves us, sent his son to be our shepherd and die for us. It was as an early Christian around some friend's house, we were watching um, a video called How Great Is Our God by Louis Giglio, which is a fantastic name. And he's going through um, stars. He's talking about how different stars are breathed into life and sort of going, this is the size of this star. And I won't talk through it, but it's well worth checking out. But basically he gets to Canis Majoris, which is the biggest star that they knew at the time. I don't know whether more have been found now, but he got to that star and he held up a golf ball. And he said, you need to consider this golf ball is Earth you need to then find yourself on said golf ball. Effectively, you'd be a, some sort of speck on that, obviously. And then to take the golf ball and place it at the foot of Mount Everest. And when you stand back and compare the size of that golf ball and that speck where you are, and the size of Mount Everest, that is the size difference between Canis Majoris and our Earth, and where you are. And this God that knows us intricately, this God that sent his only son for us, breathed that star into existence. He knows us intricately, our names are written on his hand and he sent his one and only son onto that golf boy sized earth to die for our sins so that we could have relationship with him. 
And when dangers come, as he says, the hired hand or whatever others may put their faith in will abandon them. And Jesus is the only one that remains true. And a little while ago, we've been going through our big questions um, on Tuesday nights. And our first one was around um, science uh, versus God. And off the back of that, I ended up having a conversation with a colleague who um, isn't a Christian, has done sort of different bits and pieces, he's read some bits, um, and I shared it on our Facebook. But one of the points that um, we sort of came to almost an agreement on um, to an extent is that he, he was the one that actually raised that he does believe that we have an inbuilt automatic cry out to something bigger than ourselves when danger comes. And we sort of spoke about the fact that when something major happens in the world, when there's earthquakes, forest fires, we see on social media, on the internet, hashtag pray for, insert situation here. And this is a massive normal response from people, no matter what their faith is. And we were talking about what are these people praying to? Who are they calling out to? Or we went on to discuss that, you know, if you're facing pain or a real dangerous situation, you cry out for help automatically. It's just a response, fight or flight. You just cry out. And we were talking about who do you cry out to? And he agreed that there must be something bigger than us. Now, we who are Christians and, and know Jesus, we know that we are crying out to the one who doesn't abandon us. We are calling out to the one that has already given his life for us, Jesus, our shepherd, that watches over us. And Jesus is the good shepherd that allows us to rest and restores us. He leads us to green pastures. And in John 4, Jesus is talking with the Samaritan woman at the well and says, everyone who drinks this water, talking of water in the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And then in Matthew 6, he teaches the Lord's Prayer and says, we should pray for our daily bread. He's sustaining us through feeding us. Now, I'll be the first to hold my hands up and say that at times I probably don't spend enough time truly in the presence of God, just resting and being restored. I'll pray, I'll read the daily Bible passage, but actually spending solid time properly connecting, I can sometimes struggle with. There's just so many distractions. I can pick up my phone and be reading the Bible on my phone. Next thing I know, I've got a notification that Aaron's taking his turn on a board game that we play together. And I'm like, oh, I'll take my turn on that. I'm not blaming Aaron. Um, sorry. <laughs> but, but some or another, something's come up, or a news headline or something. And all of a sudden, I've completely moved away from the point of connecting with God. And there's something else going on. You know, I'll be listening to music and then all of a sudden some sort of headlines flashed up and I've gone, oh, hang on, what's going on there? Connecting with God and actually spending that time can be difficult, so we just, I just move on. Now, I've spoken before, and I think Aaron and Marco as well, about a board game that we play together regularly. Um, and in it you have a certain amount of cards. And at the beginning you have actions to do off these cards and you choose two each turn. And once you've gone through your cards, so I have ten, we have different amounts. Once you've gone through that 10, you need to short rest to bring some back. And when you short rest, you at random lose one card from that game. And you remain nine, you start it again, you go through. But the random card could be your best card when you short rest, but you're back into the game. However, if you long rest, then you're okay, you miss some turn, but actually you regain health as well as getting to choose which card you lose. So in that moment, you are in control. And when I connect with God now, I feel like sometimes I can short rest. It does the job, it's fine, I'm connecting, but actually to get that proper restoration and clarity of what God is trying to say to me in maybe a bigger moment or a decision, spending longer dedicated time in scripture, prayer or worship is so important to truly hear from God. And my final point is the Good Shepherd looks for us. I've shared my testimony before, so I won't go over it again in detail, but if you haven't heard it, I'd be happy to share it another time. But where Jesus says in verse 16, I must bring other sheep and they too will listen to my voice. That struck me in the way that he is saying that he will be going after the other sheep. Not just sitting back thinking, how amazing am I? I am awesome, people will just come to me, that's fine. Actually, he's the one that's coming after us. 
Jesus came after me in a very clear way. And I just, I got struck again with just how incredible it was that the way that Jesus moved in my life and just chased me. In Luke 15, 4 to 7, Jesus talks about the parable of the, the lost sheep. And he talks about having a hundred sheep and if losing one. But the shepherd goes after that one who is lost. He leaves his 99 and goes after the one. And when he returns with it, he returns it and has a celebration about it. And a real beautiful detail in this is that he says in this story that when the shepherd finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. He doesn't get angry at it for wandering off. He doesn't get annoyed and make it walk back. He doesn't whip it, he doesn't punish it. Actually, he picks up that sheep, puts it on his shoulder. He takes the weight of the wayward sheep and then brings it back home and has a celebration for it. The shepherd cares about us individually and will come for us when we get lost. We are not perfect. And I'm wondering whether the gift will work, um, the short little video. It won't. I don't know whether you've seen it before, but it's worth looking up. But basically, it's a sheep stuck in a big crater. Now what happens is the shepherd pulls the sheep out of it. The sheep pops along all happy, straight back into the crater. It's, it's a shame, but I appreciate it. It was technically above what we can achieve. But the point is that we can sometimes be like that. We can receive help. We can be in a situation and we feel pulled out. And we're like, yes, I'm out. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, okay, you've been blessed me. And then we walk straight back into the situation. We can walk straight back into whatever bad habit we were in, straight back into temptation, whatever it may be, we can be pulled out and go straight back in. So potentially there's something where we do need to leave it. If there's something that might be on your heart thinking, yeah, do you know what? I need to be pulled out of that ditch. The, Jesus is running after you. Jesus is coming to find you. Turn back to God. Repent and the Father will welcome you back with a celebration. His grace and mercy is unending. And I'm sure the shepherd in that video probably walked up and then pulled the sheep out again. And probably again if it does, does it again. And we are then called to be like Jesus in our lives. We are to be the shepherds to the people around us. It says in 1 Peter 5, verse 2 to 3, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And maybe take a moment and think about who's in your flock, who's around you, who is it that we might need to tend to or help bring back if lost. It might be someone, a work situation, it might be friendship, it might be family. Who is that person? Who is within our flock to look after? Now it's Jesus' voice that will call and people will follow as he says, but we need to help them hear. We do that by sharing the good news of the gospel praying with them or sharing the love of God for them. In 2007, I met Laura, my wife, and at the time I wasn't a Christian. And I wanted to show to her that I listened to her, as sometimes it might not seem like that. So for one of our early dates together, I think it was possibly a birthday present, um, I took Laura to see her favourite band, Deliria. She had mentioned to me that's who it was. I had absolutely no idea who they were. But I bought her tickets, I saw that they were the playing. Turns out they were a Christian rock kind of band and ended up being the first real Christian thing that I was exposed to. And I did that to myself. But I see now that it was Jesus already working in me. Anyway, in the song History Maker, Martin Smith, the lead singer, he stops in a moment in the song and he ends up reading a scripture from the Bible, which was Psalm 23. And then he continues on. And this scripture stuck with me, even as a non-Christian. That made me think deeper about it. I'll read it now. And hopefully, you know, if you're here and you don't know Jesus or wouldn't call yourself a Christian yet, then maybe this will stick with you. Maybe bring you some comfort. Or if you are a Christian, just hearing this again, just be refreshed by the words of it. So Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now as we just draw to a close and go back into worship, I'd encourage you during the first song not to join in, to know that actually you're in the presence of Jesus in this place now, that you're in a place where if you feel like you need restoration, if you feel like you need to just actually give something to God, then to do it now, not to just move on to the next thing, which is, okay, we stand up and we sing the words that are on the screen now. You may feel like that's the best way to respond and that's fine. But just be encouraged that don't just do what people around you are doing just because you feel that's the thing you need to do. If you feel like you need to just stop and be in the presence of Jesus, then know that he is here today. If you have troubles at the moment or had a difficult week and still carrying things, just let it go and use this as the opportunity. And if you're here and don't know yet, don't yet know Jesus, but want to, then maybe just in this quiet time, just ask Jesus to speak to you, come into your life. And if this is you, then please, before leaving, just chat to someone, someone that's around you or someone at the front. Or maybe you feel like God's been trying to say something to you for a while. You're not sure what it is. There's something there that God's trying to say. You, you think it's there, but you can't quite hear what it is. Maybe just be like Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, where he just stopped and he said, Speak, your servant is listening. And in that moment, the Lord spoke to him. I'll pray for us now, and then if Laura and the band want to come back up and lead us back into worship, and, and we'll just respond to Jesus' worthiness and him as a good shepherd over our lives. Lord, thank you again as I did at the beginning for who you are and what you've done for us. Father, we thank you that although we were far away from you, that you came after us. Lord, I thank you that we were deep in our graves, deep in a ditch, but you as the shepherd pulled us out. You pulled us out and rescued us and you put us on your shoulders and you carried us back. And Lord, if there's people here today, they don't know you, then Lord, I just ask you just reach in, just pull them out as well. Just speak to them, Lord. Will you just be their shepherd, just knowing that you are our comfort. Lord, I thank you that you laid down your life, that you lay down in front of that gate so that we may be safe in the pen and that you keep evil away. But Father, when evil comes, that you are with us, you are there by our side that even in that darkest valley, that you are present. And Father, as we go back into to responding, Lord, if there are people here that just need to know your presence again, Lord, will you just wash over them afresh, your Holy Spirit? Lord, will you just help them to know that you are with them, that you are here by their side, and if they need picking up and putting on your shoulders, that you will do that. Father, we just pray, thank you so much for who you are. And Lord, you are worthy above everything. Amen.